Hey family, Pastor Ben Warwick here, and I'm super excited to have you joining with us today. I know the Lord's put a word on my heart, and I hope that it ministers to you right where you are. In fact, I want you to take a moment and take this link, share it with your friends, let them know this word is coming, and I want you to hang in there until the very end, because I'm going to come back and pray over your needs. So let's jump into this word and be blessed. I've been in this series called Check Your Baggage, okay? It's all about just things that we carry through life that we shouldn't carry anymore. Stuff that the cross has freed us from that we just seem to keep around. And last last week we talked about pride and how pride uh, just can really keep us from entering into the things that God has for us. Uh, And uh, I'm going to jump into a passage of scripture. In fact, would you stand with me? to John and turn to John chapter 21. Last time I'm going to ask you to stand, but I just believe I'm going to show a little respect to the Word of God. And so John chapter 21. And while you're turning there, uh, let me give you a little context of what's going on. Jesus, he's already died. He's been resurrected. He has appeared to his disciples twice already. Um, But there seems to be this unresolved tension between Peter and Jesus. They've not had a chance to really sit down and talk about some of the mistakes that, G- that Peter made while Jesus needed him most. He, he denied Jesus three times on the night that Jesus was betrayed and they've not had a chance to kind of resolve that. So let's jump into John 21. We're going to pick up in verse 1, okay? If you're with me, say I'm with you. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, and they got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children... Do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, then cast the net to the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it, so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, about a hundred yards. And when they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to him, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to him, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish... This was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples as he raised them from the dead. So you've got this interaction. Jesus is on shore. He's making some breakfast. Calls out to his disciples, miraculous catch of fish, and Peter comes running. But he's not said, he runs straight to Jesus, but there's nothing that's happened yet. No interaction. Now they're sitting around a fire, and let's look at what it says in verse 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, Then feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Then tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had asked him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, now follow me. I want to preach on this particular piece of baggage today. I want to preach on the baggage of shame today. Okay? Shame. Would you... Pray for me as I pray for you. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I just want my words to be true. True to you, Lord. True to the situations in people's lives. 
I want my words to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and full of your grace and mercy. So Lord, let that be the case today. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to your word. Lord, let us apply it to our life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You can be seated. You know, this is, uh, this is actually an old suitcase. <laughs> We've had this since we got married, and boy, it looks like it. I think the back's like all busted up. And for some reason, we have not gotten rid of this nasty piece of equipment right here. And uh, that's a lot like shame, you know? We just kind of keep it around. We keep going back to things that we're shameful of. We keep, it's, it's something that God wants to re- remove off of us. He wants to get rid of this piece of luggage in our closet and give us something new and better. But yet we still want to keep this old thing around. And shame, by the way, it's been around for a really long time. If you go back to the garden, it says, And Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed. And then sin enters the world through the fall of man. And the first thing that they do is look at each other and say, Hey, you're naked, I'm naked, let's put some clothes on. Right? And shame takes over. Y'all going to have to open up a little bit today. You're just going to have to. And shame comes in. And, and, and shame, man, it can be one of the just most, I'd say, dead weights that you can attach to your joy. Shame just seems to suck joy right out of our heart and out of our mind. And shame, it's been around for a long time, but there's a difference between shame and conviction. In fact, they're going to bring this up on a screen. And and conviction is, and by the way, if you're taking notes, there's a note card you can use in the seat back in front of you. If you want to take pictures, you can. Conviction is, is a firm notion or belief that, that something's wrong. Like you have healthy convictions, right? Like you can have healthy convictions about things you want to stand on and, and principles that you apply. And then you can have convictions when you're wrong and you know, you know, this is not something that I should be doing. This is a place where I don't need to be. And conviction is very different than shame. Shame is this painful feeling of humi- humiliation or distress, right, caused by, a, by the consciousness of wrong or of foolish behavior. And shame is what the enemy uses. Conviction is what the Holy Spirit uses to keep us within the path that God has for us. But shame is what the enemy uses to stall our walk and journey with God. And sometimes they even make it go backwards, when we sin, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us. In fact, John 16, 7 through 8 says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, Jesus is speaking here about the Holy Spirit, that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. I want you to write this down. It's the Holy Spirit's role to convict you of sin to build your conviction on what's righteous, and to give the power to discern what's good. It's a threefold thing. It convicts you of the sin that you've done wrong, right? It it, it tells you where the guardrails are. It tells you where the line is. Then it builds your convictions on what's righteous so that you can aim after the things that are righteous. And then it gives you the power to discern what is good for you and what is not good for you. What is on the path that God has for me and what's off the path. And so That's why the church has to be anchored in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be talked about, utilized, uh, demonstrated, and and felt because the Holy Spirit plays an active role in the growth and the development of a believer. And so conviction God brings, but condemnation is brought by the enemy. And Romans 10, 11 says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is there no condemnation? Because Christ, he died for our sins. He's paid the ultimate sacrifice so that condemnation and the penalty of the sins that we commit is removed off of us because the penalty for sin is death. And Christ died so that you and I could find new life. And so Christ doesn't operate in the realm of condemnation He operates in the realm of conviction to guide you in the right path. But the enemy would like nothing more than than put a death sentence of condemnation on your life and on your walk with Christ. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want you to write this down. It's not God's desire for you to return to what he brought you out of. It's not God's desire for you to go back to the very thing he rescued you from. But yet, something happens in our inner man when we get tired or we get frustrated or we get embarrassed. We seem to go back 
to the attitudes, the addiction, the, the habits, whatever it is you want to fill in your blank with, we seem to return to what we used to be instead of trying to press on to who we are called to be. And the enemy he just seems, he seems to have this uncanny gift at bringing up what God's already forgiven us of. So let's go back to this story for a second, okay? Peter, Peter and some of the disciples were fishermen pre-Jesus, okay? B.C., before Christ, they were, they were fishermen, and this is what they did for a living. They were career fishermen. And the first time that Jesus has this interaction with them in Matthew chapter 4, they've been out all night, and they've not caught anything, and Jesus says, hey, why don't you put out there a little bit of ways and, and cast your net over the other side? And they argue, and they reluctantly do what Jesus says they're going to do, and they pull in this insane haul of fish where they have to call in other boats to haul it. Just this massive catch. And it, it's so moving that Peter and the disciples jump out of the boat, they get on their knees before the Lord, and they commit their life to Jesus. But fast forward to this moment, and man, a lot has happened. A lot has happened. Peter has seen Jesus do miracles after miracles, and including miracles to cover his own stupidity. Uh, when Peter cut a dude's ear off, Jesus had to miraculously put it back on, right? But most important, after claiming he would never leave Jesus, the very night he said, I'm never going to leave you, I'm never turn my back on you, that very night Peter denies Jesus three different times. Why? To save his own skin. In the moment that Jesus really needed Peter to step up, Peter fell on his face. And he ran away from Jesus in his greatest moment of need. And so you can imagine, right, you can imagine the shame that Peter probably feels when he knows he denied Jesus three times, he knows he abandoned Jesus in his greatest moment of need, and he watched his Savior die on a cross and the guilt that was on his heart then. And then when Jesus comes back to life, not only does he have all that guilt that he paired with, but now he knows there's an awkward conversation coming my way. This dude's going to ask me about why I didn't do what I said I would do. Because we all, that's the thing, is we're all out here trying to make promises and fulfill them, and sometimes we shoot way too high, and we fall short, and we feel like God doesn't want anything to do with us. But man, this story is proof that even when you fall on your face, God still wants to be a part of your life. And so that's where we find him in John 21. In fact, I want to read verses 2 through 3, right? Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, all these guys were fishermen before, and two of the other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we'll go with you. And they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And Peter says, I'm going back to fishing. Let me tell you something. There's something about, there's significance in that, Okay. Since Jesus called him out of that life of being a fisherman, he gave him a new career. Peter's not gone back and done any fishing that we can read of in Scripture. He's not gone back to his old life. He's not gone back to tend the boats and the nets. In fact, he's gone on with Jesus, and for three years he's been right there with the Lord, one-on-one, -on -one, step in step, watching God perform miracles. And Peter is dealing with so much shame and guilt in this moment and, and of, of denying Jesus and falling short on his face. What does this leader of the disciples do? He goes back to who he used to be and he drags the rest of them with him. Instead of waiting around for more of what Jesus was asking them to do or even looking for what Jesus was going to say to do next, they just decide to go back to who they used to be. And hear me, the enemy would like nothing more than for you and I to take a momentary pause on our journey with Christ and go back to who he used to be. And I want you to write this down. The devil is never taking you someplace new. He always brings you back to sin. He's not taking you on some new exciting journey. You're going to find out that whatever path he does want to put you on, it just makes a loop. It makes a loop all the way back to sin, all the way back to sorrow, all the way back to the bottom of the pit where Jesus found you. But yet we, we in our moment of frustration or in our moment of weakness, go, you know what, I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to go back. There's life with Jesus, hear me, and there's life without Jesus. There's not a third option. There's not a middle ground. You can't go, well, I'm going to serve the Lord and get the benefits of serving the Lord, but there's some things that I want to do out here in the world too all at the same time. You can't be both. You can't be on both sides of a fence. It's a little painful, by the way, if you've ever tried to straddle a fence, right? So don't. Don't think that there's some kind of third option. In fact, God... God wants you to come over to his side. He wants you to come walk this path that has life and life more abundantly for you. But just like Peter, we get embarrassed 
about our mistakes, and we seem to run right back to the very thing that Jesus pulled us out of. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. But the good news is this, is the good news is that even when we are dumb enough to go back to shame and the things that God delivered us from, he still reaches down and picks us up. In fact, 2 Corinthians, give the Lord praise for it, man. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, what does it say? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And the devil would like nothing more than to smother your new life and revive your old life. But I'm here to declare to some of you today, as a prophetic word, as your pastor, that the only revival that's going to take place in your mind and in your heart is going to be revival of the Holy Spirit, not of the revival of the old man and what you used to be and what you did. Because there is a new life in Christ. There is hope. There is peace. There is joy. There are so many things in a life with Christ that the enemy could never even come close to doing. So why pick the path that you know ends up nowhere? And here's a question that I have for you. What are you running back to that God's called you out of? Like, what are you, what are you running back to that you just need to leave and leave again? On a side note, I love that the Bible is pretty blunt, and uh, the end of verse 3, what does it say? say? And they fished all night, and they didn't catch anything, man. Come on. Lousy fishermen. I mean, this is a career fisherman, and they couldn't even get it done one night on the water. And then, you know, that's another thing about Christians that I know, that is that Christians who serve the Lord with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and they start walking down this path of God, and then they choose to go back to sinning, they look real dumb doing it. It's like you, you like look dumb trying to do the things that you used to be because you're not who you used to be. You're a new man, and so you're trying to do this stuff. It's like Christians are bad sinners. Like they're bad at sinning. They try to, but it just doesn't work out that well. And just like Jesus found him the first time, he finds him a second time. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that even in my worst moments, Jesus has never run away from me. Come on, he's been good to me. He's, he, he's picked me up and put me in my right mind more times than I'd like to admit. First time they meet Jesus, uh, he performs this miracle. They, they catch all these fish, right? Same situation. They've been out all night long, haven't caught anything. And look at verse 5 through 7. Let's read that. Jesus said to him, children, do you not have any fish? They answered, no. He said to them, then cast your net to the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, which, by the way, is the writer of this book. It's John. That's how conceited he is. He calls himself that. He doesn't refer to his name. He says, the disciple who Jesus loved more than the rest of them. <laughs> That's kind of what I do to my siblings. Hey, I'm, I'm the favorite child, and you all are playing second. He says to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. So the first time he catches them, they're not caught anything. And the second time, Jesus catches them fishing again. And what does he do? He goes back to the original way that he captured their attention. He goes back to the original way that he showed them that he was God. Why? Why repeat it? Why? Why not just walk out there and yell at them, right? Because as, as a dad, that, that's my instant reaction. When I see my kids doing something dumb that they shouldn't be doing, because what they should have been doing is not fishing, by the way. They should have been Seeking after the things of the Lord. They should have been looking for the Lord and asking God, hey, what do you want me to do next? What's this plan for you? Instead, they're so frustrated that they just go fishing. Now, if it was me, I'd probably go out there and be like, hey, what are you idiots doing? You know, there's a reason why you haven't caught any fish. I'm keeping them away from the boat, right? And all this, all this stuff is happening and, and, and everything. And I would do it that way. But what does Jesus do? He just chooses to reveal himself one more time in the way that he revealed himself the first time. I want you to write this down. It's not God's desire to shun you in your shame. It's his desire to rescue you out of it again. Like, yeah, you fell on your face. Congratulations. Join the club. The rest of us, I mean, it takes just a little bit of traffic to bring the worst out in some of us. You fell on your face. Congratulations. But guess what? The same Jesus that found you, man, the same Jesus that found you back then is the same Jesus that's with you today. He's not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he loved you enough the first time, by God, he sure loved you enough this time. And Peter didn't even know when he went fishing that night 
He did not know that Jesus was about to show him the power of a second chance. He's about to show him the power of forgiveness. And Jesus revisits their original moment of redemption in this moment. And he, he reaches them this way because he knew that the moment that they grabbed a net full of fish that was so insane after not fishing anything all night, they'd realize exactly who it was. They'd know in that moment, oh, I've seen this thing before. And that's us, man. Right in the middle of our shame, we begin to realize what grace is and what true love is. And you go, you know what? I've felt this thing before. I've been forgiven this way before. And you can't help but do what Peter did. And you drop what you're doing and run after the Lord. And shame, let me tell you something about shame. It's just a return journey. It's not going anywhere. It's just a loop. It just brings you back. It brings you back to what happened. It re- it's a return back to what you did. It's a return back to what you said. The lie that you believe, and you, and, and you do that because you think that there, this new life is too hard and that maybe it's easier going back. But let me tell you something. Do not let the enemy give you some kind of amnesia that you forget what life was like pre-Jesus. Amen. That life was like before he found you. That's why I think it's so powerful, by the way, to share your testimony. People all the time tell me, well, I can, I can, never, I can never preach. I don't really know the Bible like you. Like, I don't really know how... I can't memorize it A to Z, but let me tell you something. The best tool you have, the greatest tool you have for evangelism is your own story. Is what God did for you. I, that's not in a book somewhere. That's in, that's in your heart. And so when you begin to share that, let me tell you what happens. When you begin to share about the goodness of God and how he saved you and found you, it begins to give hope to that person who's listening, and it reminds you. It humbles you. It brings you back to the moment that God found you and you had this sudden remembrance, just like Peter, of what grace really was and what, what the love of Jesus really was. And you and I, we don't need a revival of old habits. We need a revival of the power of God in our life. Just like Jesus found you in the first moment, I'm here to tell you he'll find you in a second moment, in, a, in the 3,000th moment. His love goes on and on and on and on. And the moment this net is full, John just knows, right? What does he do? He looks over at Peter and says, hey, that's the Lord. Straight up, I've seen this thing before. You need to get out there. And Peter, and look at what Peter does. Okay, let's go to verse 7, okay? This is powerful. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. I want, I want you to get this. Earlier in the night, Peter took the garment, the nice clothes that he had on, and he took them off to get down to some work clothes and go back to the life that he gave him. You see, Peter has not been dressed up super nice, but he's been dressed way more presentable the last three years because he's been traveling around and he's been ministering for the Lord. So he can't come in, in some swimming trunks and, 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 a, and a cut-off tee and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? So he looks a little better. But when he chooses to go back fishing again, man, I feel the Lord. When he chooses to go back fishing again, what does he do? He takes off all of that outer witness and he goes back to that old man, back to that old life, and he jumps in that boat and he gets to working. But the moment that he realizes it's Jesus, what does he do? He turns around and he picks up the mantle that God put on him when he got out there the first time and he puts it back on and he runs. And hear me, that's, that's symbolic He's saying, I, I, I'm done with all this mess. I'm done with what I was. I'm done with this, this mistake and the shame. And I'm going to put back on that robe of glory. I'm going to put back on that robe of forgiveness and of healing. He puts a cloak on. He jumps in the water. And he races to Jesus. And if you're struggling, by the way, if you're struggling with shame in here today, the best thing you can do is put back on the robe of grace. To put it back on, put back on the new life, the the mercy of God that you've already experienced by giving your heart to Jesus Christ. And if you find yourself putting grace down like Peter did in that boat, pick it back up, man. Pick it back up and put it on. You need it. You need that covering. You need that mantle on you day after day. And now, now that he makes it to the shore, look at what he does in verse 15, okay? Let's read 15 through 19. And when Simon, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you that when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands like another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said that to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Peter was crucified upside down. And after saying this, he said, now follow me. Three times Jesus says, hey, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? And he does that on purpose. You see, Peter, he denied Jesus three times. He said, I don't know that guy. I'm not one of his disciples. And what Jesus was saying by asking him three times is he's saying, for every time you've made an offense, I have forgiveness for that one thing. I will forgive you every time you made offense. I'll forgive you every time you let me down, Peter, every time you turn your back on me. And not only does he forgive him, but he says, now feed my sheep. He gives him a task. Now tend my sheep. Now now follow me. Because God will forgive you, and God wants to forgive you, and God has plenty of forgiveness for you, but God still has work for you and I to do. He's not, he's not going to forgive you, and now you're damaged goods, and you can never serve the Lord again. No, man, restoration is possible with the Lord, and he restores you back to his intention for you. Jesus, I'm telling you something, Jesus is in the people business. He's in the people building business. That even when mistakes are made in the construction process by us, he just fixes us back up again. And I'm going to invite our team to come as I wrap this up. But just like Jesus calls him in Matthew chapter 4 to join the ministry, Jesus calls him in John 21 to return to the ministry. Now follow me. Follow me. You know, this is really like a maturation moment for Peter. He, He definitively changes here. You see, the Peter before this moment is the Peter who sleeps uh, when Jesus needs him to stay awake in the garden. He's the Peter who can't heal the boy possessed with demons. He doesn't have enough faith. He's the Peter who cuts a dude's, dude's ear off. He's the Peter who denies Jesus three times. In fact, it's like Peter has like this long scroll of mistakes that he's made and things that he's done wrong, but yet in this moment, he seems never to return back to the stupidity of those past few moments. Something changes in him. In fact, he... He becomes the Peter that we read about in just a couple chapters later in Acts that stands before everybody, preaches, and thousands of people come to know the Lord from this guy who's just a fisherman, and then he turns around and ends up in front of all of the most educated men in all of Jerusalem, and he begins to talk about Jesus and the work in scriptures, and what do they say? Surely this uneducated man has been with Jesus because he speaks with authority. Man, something happens in this moment when God forgives him and sets him loose. You never see Peter make this immature mistake again. Now, I'm sure he made mistakes. But you never see him go back to doing the stuff that he was doing before. And hear me, that's a word for somebody in here today. That, yeah, you fell on your face. Congratulations. Yeah, you you might have a litany of, of past mistakes that are way wrong and falling apart. But just one touch with the Lord, man. Just one word over your life by God. And he can take all that stuff that you broke and he can put things together in the right way and send you on this path. The time, hear me, the time of growth for some of you is now. It's not later. It's now. This now. God's creating this separation between your past and your future. And this shame, it's got to go. It's got to be left. It's baggage that has to be left behind. Because you're never, if you ever try to run through an airport by hauling luggage... We've all seen you fall, right? We've all seen you kick. And if you're anything like me, I kick myself when I run, so I for sure kick my bags when I run because my legs are so long. Like you just look dumb and you're not fast. And we're trying to run this race with Christ by grabbing a hold of all this stuff. But what I love about the Lord, man, is that even in the middle of our stupidity, he'll find a way to put us back on track. I don't know what's the greatest miracle that happens in this, the fact that they caught this massive net of fish or the fact that Jesus kept the fish away all night long to prove a point. I don't know what it is. And and by the way, man, they come to this breakfast, right? And what does the word say? That they get to the shore and Jesus has fish and bread on the fire. Jesus didn't have a net. Jesus didn't have an oven out there. He wasn't baking bread in the middle of the shoreline. 
Just another miraculous moment that even when they got to the shore, Christ had already prepared for them a meal of refreshment after a night of mistakes. Man, and I'm telling y'all something right now, that's that's the grace of the Lord. Is that after a night of mistakes, man, God prepares a meal of love and mercy that you're not going to find anywhere else, but you can find it in him. He says, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Then tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. Then feed my sheep. He's saying, I forgave you. Now now get back to following me. Get back to the work that I called you to. I don't care how many of you mistakes you made. It may be hundreds. You may have asked the Lord a million times to forgive you of something. You may have gone back to the very shameful thing he brought you out of. But let me tell you something. He's still looking at you saying, I forgive you. Now follow me. Follow me. Leave the baggage behind. It's not going to fit with you through the metal detector of heaven. Just leave it. And if you find yourself living in shame today, I want you to look at these hallmarks of of the way out of shame. Here's the way out of shame in this story that I see. First of all, God reveals himself to you. God's doing that right now. If you're wondering that there's going to be some kind of moment between you and the Lord where a light shines in your bedroom and he comes down and shows up in the middle of it. Let me tell you something. God, God speaks to preachers and through his word and he's telling you right now, you better come back to the shore. Stop fishing. Leave the shame. And then what he does is the moment that he makes you aware of where you are and how far you are, he reassures you of his love. Like, hey, you're too far, but just know this. I love you and I want you to come back. And not only does he bring you back, but he restores you through grace. His grace is sufficient. It's sufficient for what you need. And then what does he do? He doesn't just fix you up and make you this beautiful trophy to put on a wall. He makes you a tool to be used for the kingdom of God and he sends you out because you have now been equipped with a powerful witness of what the love of God and the grace of God can do. And so if you find yourself in this journey of shame today, God's speaking to you. He's not only speaking to you, but he wants to reassure you of his love and restore you through his grace. And he wants to release you to work. This, this right here, this is called the ministry of reconciliation. You can find it in Romans chapter 5, okay? Ministry of reconciliation. We reckon to, the root word for reconciliation is reconcile, right? It's to, make, it's to restore friendly relationships or to make accounts consistent with one another. We all have shame about something that we've done wrong, and it's as if shame is like a bill, And we keep looking at our past and looking at the mistake we made last night and we've got this bill and we're just like, man, I got all this debt and I don't know what to do. And if you ever drown in debt, you really feel like you don't know what to do. But let me tell you something about the shame that's associated with your mistakes, okay? That's a bill that's already been paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you'll ask for forgiveness, he'll pay that tab every time. Because he desires for you to leave the old you and walk in the new you. And I've asked you this question every week, and they're going to put it up on the screen. What do you need to leave? What baggage do you need to leave behind in order to flourish? What baggage do you need to leave behind in order to flourish? Last week we talked about pride. This week we talked about shame. You can't take this with you. And it's time for some of you to just leave it. I know it's painful. I know you made a major error. Heaven's full of people that made errors. They just happened to, they happened to reach up from the bottom of the pit and grab the hand of a Savior who loved them. So would you stand with me today? Hey, family, I hope that word blessed you. In fact, I believe that that word is touching lives right now. And maybe that's you. Maybe you feel a million miles away from Christ, but you know right now you need to make a decision to give your heart to Him. I would love to give you that opportunity right now In fact, if that's you, I would love for you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and make me whole. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if that's you and you made that decision, we'd love to hear from you. And maybe you've got some other prayer requests or needs that you'd like for us to pray for. I'd love for you to use the email link listed below and let us know what's on your mind. Thanks for coming out and listening to today's message, and we'd love to see you back later next week.